If you want to get to the essence of your case, sometimes you have to go through the fire of distillation. I'm Cliff Atkinson, founder of Visual Storyteller School, and my guest today specializes in taking complex ideas and boiling them down to their essence. I am so thrilled today to be joined by Dr. Jane Fraser. So Jane is a trial psychologist. She is a very accomplished trial consultant working on cases all over the country. She, I've, worked, I've known her for at least 15 years and have been first party witness to how smart, how, you know, how she's able to cut through the clutter and help her clients win. So Dr. Fraser, thank you so much for joining me today. It is my pleasure. Since we're both visual people, I thought that we might play a visual game and I would just put up an image like a Rorschach test and we could just talk about that. Is that okay? Sure. All right, great. All right, so let's see. How about, how about this? <laughs> the infamous blue buckets. <laughs> Even we were surprised at the unbelievable <laughs> impact they had, how persuasive they were. Uh, the buckets were what the jurors wanted to talk about after the trial was over. When they saw information being taken that belonged to one person moved over surreptitiously to the pile of another person, it was so much more persuasive than words alone could have been or an image alone. We're working on a case out in Texas, really complicated, right? It was like a financial, a business case. Right. And then we came up with this, it was so complex, difficult to understand. I don't remember how we even came up with the bucket. Were we just brainstorming or what, what happened? Do you remember? I'm sure it was I, my idea. I don't remember exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and so we created something that was like this slide here where, where then um, we described how the CEO had taken all these complex financial instruments and put them all into this bucket and then he came up with another bucket which belonged to his friends and then he came up with a way to discount all these and give them all to his friends that was the essential story for folks who may not be familiar with that so so then how do you think that worked i guess to help the jurors to grab onto that complex concept and you look at this in terms of kids in a sandbox. They've got their pails. We all know from the time that we're kids, you don't take something out of somebody else's sandbox and just move it over to yours unless that's the right thing to be doing. Uh, it was so simple, it w but it told so much. It not only talked about what was going on with these particular individuals, because Let's be honest about this. They don't know these people. The jurors don't. They don't care about these people. But what they do care about is what is right and what is wrong. And it's not right to take something that belongs in somebody else's bucket. For, you know, if people are struggling to, to take this abstraction and come up with a metaphor, and then we added a visual onto that metaphor to make it sticky, but that, that's pretty hard stuff. And I know that yeah, as we've talked before, that, that one of the things that you say you really love to do is to distill complexity down to the essence, to find the heart of this case. So how, how do you do that? Like what is it? And is that a learned skill or is it just uh, something people come gifted with? What do you think? I think anyone can learn it if they start looking for the right things. We're as lawyers, we're trained so much to look at evidence. What is the evidence? And think if the jurors will just hear the evidence, they will come to the right decision, i.e. the decision we want them to, to come to. That's just not the case at all. We want to bring in the evidence, obviously the facts are what the case is about, but we want to present it in a way that will be memorable. But because you get us in the world, but if it's not presented in a form that will be remembered and used in the way you want it to be used, it's not valuable to you. All right, so the next image is this one. <laughs> uh, the image. <laughs> the infamous outlining <laughs> tool. So if folks aren't familiar, so, so Jane and I, you know, have been fortunate enough, we will come in and, and um, you know, help lawyers to take these really complicated cases in, in one day. We'll, we'll dive in 
and help them to outline the case. Pretty much half the day, we'll use a tool that looks something like this to help them to boil down the case to three big points. And then we kind of take the timeline and then we come up with the evidence that backs that up. But Jane, you know, we've worked so much doing this together and you know, we've talked before that, that that first half of the day in the morning oh. can be so hard. <laughs> it's painful, it is painful. And lawyers have been working on their cases for so long and, and, and most attorneys know this. they'll come to me and they'll say, I, don't, I can't see it anymore. I don't know what's important. I don't know what matters, what doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. This helps you frame your case. This helps you figure out what your story is. And you've done this so masterfully. This is where, you know, I've just learned so much from doing this with you. So um, it helps organize the information. It helps figure out, helps you figure out what is important and what is not. What are the main things you need to be getting across and how to frame them in a way that gets your story across. Because here's what we know, whoever tells the best story wins, right? Yeah. Well, and then, you know, one of the things that strikes me too about this process and how we're, we're you know, helping out these folks too, is just that, you know, we'll often walk in and they might say, you know, I've got 20 amazing documents that we want to show. I've got all this great evidence. Let's just start, you know, often they'll start, well here, you know, and start listing out all that information and one of the things that i'm that's coming up for me now is that this is a tool of constraint you know so i we always start out like what are the big three points what's the big anchor points of the story and it changes over time but that i don't know that and, and you know we mentioned when i first showed this too that there can actually be you know it can be painful to 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 boil this down you know is, is that pain just the cost of <laughs> the cost of distilling oh. Well, I think part of it is you want to get everything in because it feels so important. It feels like they just have to have this one more little piece. It's like talking about a bad breakup. You just want to, you know, let them know, just, you know, you kind of need to know this piece too. But really less is more very often. Yes. And but it is because it does mean not including everything. It does mean changing words into from legal ease a lot of the time into rare kinds of sentences that humans use and therefore understand. <laughs> Many attorneys are resistant to doing that. Oh, well, we can't do that because that isn't exactly what it says. Well, that's not what we're doing here. We're not in this process saying exactly what it says. We're saying what it is about while staying within the confines of the law and the judge's instructions, of course. Well, you know, that exactly is one of the things I'm, I'm in awe of you about <laughs> is that you're, you're such a, a passionate advocate on behalf of the jurors, you know, really forcing those lawyers to take all this stuff they might be holding on to really tightly and saying, well, what's what's the way a juror would look at this? What's jury language? You know, you gotta take it out of that legalese and make it easy to understand. Um, so do you find that that's a big challenge? Is that a central challenge when you're, when you're helping it, lawyers? It is. I heard it said one time, um, that you go to law school and get a law bottomy and forget how to speak. <laughs> And that's, you know, I just have to compliment you that you're, you're just, you just have such a gift, you know, with really helping to, to, you know, make sure that the jurors are going to understand the story, you know, so it's just so wonderful. So uh, let's go on then. So after we've had that very painful half day <laughs> of distilling, uh, then, then, then there's this, you know, then, then we convert that outline into the basics of, a storyboard, you know, and start to build the slides. So what, what's, it, what's it been like, you know, after, after we go through all that pain, you know, about two o'clock in the afternoon, and now we're finally mm -hmm. to, able to work in the slides, like how, what's mm -hmm. that experience like for folks who haven't been there? You, you really see the true story emerge for the first time and you start seeing things 
you didn't even know you had created and things. You, and also you'll see gaping holes sometimes. Yeah. Um, I'm looking for the amount of if there uh, is enough visual imagery, if there are, is word overload, if we've you know gotten into the ditch. But this is, I believe, where you really see if the story is emerging the way you want the story to emerge. And I guess for folks who may not have participated in something like this, it's also, there's a really iterative sort of process. We're continually cutting and cutting. It seems like cutting is the main thing that, that we do from beginning to end. It's just like cutting of too many words. Let's distill this down that it just becomes, ideally, if we're, if we're having a great day, this is turning out amazing. It's becoming simpler and simpler and clearer and clearer and more powerful. You're, Cliff, you're just saying something so important that I want to stop you. It's that cutting that is, it's easier for us than it is for the attorneys that we work for. Because attorneys' tendency is to add. They want to put more, a little bit more. And we've had these presentations that we've made before, sent them to the attorneys to, re to review and all, and then we actually get back these things that we don't even recognize. Sometimes they'll take it upon themselves. And you said something to me that was so classic. This was 15 or 20 years ago when I said, you know, I said, what happened to this? You said, have you ever met an attorney that said, I think there are too many words in here or there's too much in here. We need to take a little bit out. And the answer is no. But that, <laughs> uh, what you're mentioning here is that's what takes place in here is critically important, mm. cutting it down so to I the love essence. That, but, you know, I completely am in, in sync with you with this, like, you know, you're, you're this love of the distilling and the cutting and, and, and that, that, you know, once we found in that, that difficult work in the, in the morning, finding that story thread and keeping it simpler, then, then it really provides this backbone for the visuals, but that you really have to have this vigilance <laughs> from beginning to end to after it's all over to, to resist adding more stuff on there because that just starts to break down the simplicity and the, the hard work that we did leading up to it. Right, and it hurts. I know that sounds so simple while we're saying it, but it really will feel like I have to have this in here. And you don't. You, you can say it. You can say it during your case. It will come in. It just doesn't all have to come in right now. It's like any good uh, storyteller knows in a film. You don't give them all your good stuff in the beginning. You hold back and pace yourself. That's a great point because in the context of the whole trial, this is really that distilled. You know, I think we tend to do about 45 minutes you know, worth of content. Right. That's really the distilled emotional you know, the, the, the hook or, you know, that many TV shows will start with some sort of hook to grab you, but then that's just laying the framework for what's going to happen the rest of the week, two weeks, however long the trial is. Right. I think we want the, we want the hook and then we want this because we want the jurors to be suspicious of everything they hear the other side saying yes. after we have finished our opening. So that's one of the main things we want to accomplish. We want them, we want the hook, we want them to be suspicious, and we want, it just went out of my mind when something came up. Um, we want the hook, we want them to be suspicious, and we want them to be ticked off at the other side, right? Well, that's my next image. <laughs> A juicer, but the other thing, you know, besides the distilling <laughs> that I'm in awe of is just that you're so such an advocate for the this emotion, you know, how to make sure that they're feeling the way that you would like them to feel in order to win this case. You know, so with what you're just saying, you want them to be angry or and I think often you know, we might look at that storyboard and then you're you're the first one to say, well, where's the where's the juice? Where's the emotion? Like, where is it? Where do they why would they care about this? So so tell me about that, because that's just so important. I mean, because we could have that elegant storyline. You could have all the facts lined up. But still, you know, 
a couple once or twice, we might have ended up a day saying we still there's still something missing. <laughs> you know? So tell us about yeah. that miss that that crucial ingredient. That crucial ingredient. If you know, if you're looking in your case, just if your case is more focused on liability, the emotion isn't that important. But the uh, although it certainly helps. Like I said, jurors are looking for good, bad. Who who are the good guys? Who are the bad guys? Where's the right and wrong here? But the more strongly they feel about something, the more likely they are obviously to find in your favor. But the damages go all the way up. If uh, if we have not angered the juror at, at or or have them be dislikeful, if have them not like the other side, blah blah. blah. If by the end of opening statement, if the jurors don't have at least a slight dislike for the other side, and hopefully they're pretty angry at them for what they've done, then you can't expect um, much from them. This is great because it's really about that the emotional, this emotion that we're trying to advocate, right? That that's got to be there. They've got to care. Right. Emotion damages. The angrier they are, the more likely they are to award damages. And the other so thing is, even jurors who are very analytical and operate way more out of, they will tell you they operate way more out of logic than emotion. If you get them angry enough, they are the ones who are doing the billions and billions of dollars in ver verdicts. It's the they're the hanging jury, you know, Katie bar the door if they see all kinds of bad acts. Yeah. So really, you know, and it's one of the things too that, you know, I do talk to audiences who are not familiar with legal, you know, presentations and so on. And one of the things I tell them that the, a big challenge is you've got to build this story, for, you know, you've, you've got the, you've got the building blocks, you know, based on the evidence of the case and you can't make up anything. You can't add yeah. anything into that. So, so there's partly the art of, you know, working with what you have, but then, you know, you, you know, so I'm kind of curious about that line with, you know, sometimes you've got some, some action or something that happened that is just, you know, the smoking gun, you know, it's just so emotionally powerful, but other times it can be more challenging as we found to, 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 to kind of find that the emotional hook, right? Like, you know, so I'm just curious, like what to hear, like, what do you think about that? You're just you, you want to look for how that could show up in that person's own life. Anything that they will be able to relate to through personal experience will bring them more towards that. OK. Awesome. You know, well, there's maybe nothing so traumatic about, you know, somebody telling you they're going to fix your roof for this many dollars and doing it for that. But if it's happened to you before or something similar to that, you can bring some emotion in to that. So what you want to do is make it a more general kind of issue and feeling and, and go in for that. And I've heard some folks say that it's a good practice too in your focus groups, just to, to be testing, to ask them to see, you know, you're really test pre-testing or test driving some of this information to see where those emotional touchstones are. Because sometimes you might think, you know, that this is, oh, they're going to hate this or, you know, they're going to feel this way. But then when you actually focus group, maybe not, and maybe it's something else. Absolutely. I cannot imagine going into a trial of any size without doing a focus group. You can do anything from a little bitty casual um, focus group to full scale, you know, uh, using consultants and doing mock trials and multiple focus groups. But that is where you find out not what you think, but what the jury thinks, especially after you hear the same thing from groups two and three, you start hearing it multiple times. So very often there have been things that um, I would have thought would have outraged a jury and they just weren't at all. One thing was something that was I thought just horribly discriminatory. And they said, well, you know, that was 20 years ago. That's kind of how things were back then. I, I just couldn't even believe it. But then there were other things that hadn't occurred to me at all that infuriated many in the group or aroused a lot of emotion in them. Either um, it, it isn't always anger is the point I'm trying to make. They can okay. feel compassion and many other feelings that will drive uh, verdicts as well. 
And so maybe that's something, you know, just for lawyers and folks that are working like this is just to be sure when, when you are, as you're describing in your focus groups, making sure that you're you're looking for those, that emotion, you know, in addition to all the other things you're trying to do, like, where is it that they feel something that you can then integrate into the story? Yes. And by, the way to do that is not by you presenting it to them and asking if that evokes emotion in them, but instead just telling the story pretty neutrally and hearing what they say back to you. Yes. Letting them offer up what is uh, significant to them. Yes. Don't say, what did you think about this piece of evidence? What did you think about that piece of evidence? Because you're sending them a message. That's important. That's important. Instead, you say, tell me the things, tell me what you thought, open-ended. And they're going to tell you straight from the beginning the things that they, that, that they didn't like. So you're really having to step back and listen, just a prompt and step back and listen. Absolutely. Absolutely. Open-ended. Um, and then I've got one other, I've got another image here. So we've often looked at, you know, once we've got the story in place, we go into image selection, we find metaphors. <laughs> so this is, tell me about this image. What does it bring up for you? <laughs> What do I need to say? It's that's what I love about this is it says everything. Now, the the other thing that you know we can talk about how many variations of this that we have. Some this man has on a suit, and does he have French cuffs? And does he have cufflinks? <laughs> sometimes it's fingers pointing like this, and and it's a work shirt, or sometimes it's uh, you know banking, depending on what the situation is. But this is, uh, you know, somebody keeping a secret, doing something they shouldn't be doing. Well, and then, you know, we can we can show this like this too, and then not really, you know, it looks. Oh, it's just in this, this case, it's just a you know stock art you could get off the internet or something. But so it looks so simple, but this is really the top layer of a very sophisticated strategy. You know, so when that we've done that morning of the distilling, getting down to the essence and then find, well, this is about hiding. Then you've got the storyboard and this, then this is gonna play in at one particular scene in that story. And then with what we we're just saying, you've got the image, but so the image is actually communicating so much. Like you just said, based on the cuffs where it's, what, it's a suit well fitting, haircut, man, woman, whatever image you choose is then conveying volumes of information on top of that, much of which you don't even need to say, right? You don't even need to say. Don't mess it up with words. <laughs> right. Don't put any words on the screen above this. So we're even talking, you know, as we've talked about this whole time together is distillation. Now we're getting to the level of, so this, is, this is a visual distillation of volumes of information and just showing this by itself with nothing else could say volumes. I could just Absolutely. say so much. So this is just wonderful. And then we've also, you know, there's that one and then lots those of the, the Those are the ones that very often are the biggest takeaways. Uh, in one that you and I did together, it was a, I believe it was the sixth slide because I would show the uh, PowerPoint to people without saying a word. And by the time I would click on the slide six, there was an audible gasp and their mind had been made up. Okay. On that slide, there are no words. There are just a number of images by themselves and it tells such an amazing story that the case is over at that point. And it's so hard to do that. <laughs> you know, it's not Very hard, it looks easy. <laughs> To get to that point of just having stripped away so much, the volumes, the abstraction, the difficulty, and just present that simple image, that's actually really hard work. It's what Do you know that Mark Twain saying, like, I would have written you a short note, but I didn't, <laughs> I didn't have the time? <laughs> Whatever, a paraphrase there, but, but that... You know what? What we what we often work so hard an entire day. You know, is just you know getting to the point. Oh, it's, it looks. Oh, it's just a piece of clip art. It's not. It's actually the 
the yes. top of a pyramid or the just the process of distilling this down to this this very finely tuned <laughs> prompt that then makes such an impact you know it really kind of resonates and gets in there at a level that otherwise it's hard to do absolutely um well i'm curious as we're kind of wrapping up you know we've worked together a, a 15 years, I think it is. And I'm, I want to know more about your own personal journey of, you know, I know now you've, you've become a PowerPoint ninja yourself. <laughs> you're, you're working in slides and now you're this master, you know, you're, you're, you're loving working on, on your, uh, you have an Air, right? MacBook Air computer. Yes. So I remember back 15 years ago, you're on the Blackberry. <laughs> <laughs> it was the size of a shoe. So I'm curious for your your own personal evolution from a BlackBerry 15 years ago to you know where you are today, where you'll be in the future. But you know this tool, your MacBook Air, like how how have you evolved? How have you changed personally with working with technology and with with even PowerPoint? I was so resistant because I trained um, my computer training began so early in graduate school that it frightened me. It, I had punch cards in the computer <laughs> in the first era That's and so hard. <laughs> that far back it went. Uh, but uh, I would say certainly uh, the best way for me to say anything is if I can do it, anyone can do it because it isn't something that I come by naturally. And over the years and with a lot of uh, uh, gentle teaching by good friends such as Cliff, um, I feel that that it's something that I can do and I could do it um, on the spot if I had to. If I was in the courtroom and needed to make some changes, I could do it right there. And, and as, as I've seen folks start to learn these tools and do, and do exactly that, I mean, I do sense that there's, there's some empowerment, right? Or a liberation, like I can go do this and you can make it happen and do it quickly. Like you're not tired of other people <laughs> having to come in and do this. <laughs> It is so empowering. I remember the very first time I said, you know, I can do this. And I opened the, the PowerPoint application. I wrote in a title. I clicked an image of a, I got a cow. I remember I just pulled the image over and put it on. And I said, you know what? I can do this. And yeah. the rest is history. Well, you are an inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> And thank you so much for joining me today. You know, I, I'd love to have you back if, if you'll join me. <laughs> but oh, can, I feel like we've just started to scratch the surface about, you know, this intersection of the, you know, distilling, the imagery. The, we didn't even talk today about the psychology, getting into jurors' minds, and then your very sophisticated work at, you know, using focus grouping, the research techniques, and then having all that feed, this amazing intuition to be able to go in and, 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 and help your clients pick the jurors that are gonna get them the results they're looking for. It's just, you know, I feel like we just opened the door a little bit. Great, <laughs> so ask me back, I'd love to. I wanna have you back, definitely. So thank you so much, Dr. Fraser, yeah. for uh, joining me today. And uh, I look forward to having you back soon. Okay, thanks. So like Dr. Fraser just described, it can be really hard work to distill something to its essence, but when you finish and get to the end product, you've come up with a visual, clear, powerful image that can help you to plant your ideas in the minds of your audiences. So I'm Cliff Atkinson, founder of Visual Storyteller School. I'm so glad you could join me today with Dr. Jane Fraser, and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.